let's start with cons okay. oh that okay <coughs> excuse me so most of us cook simply we don't go into you know um very flamboyant ingredients and hard to find things or things that are very elaborate in making but we do have friends and neighbors who may offer us portions of seasonal desserts and treats, some casseroles, some side dishes, some breads and pastries. And the first thing I want to do is say everything will fit. And what we, the way to make that happen is to use what I call the plate method. Okay. Plate method says, and I, I hope you're familiar because I often um, introduce this theme whenever I um, do a presentation, because it's, it's to me almost magic. Here how, here's how it goes. A fourth of the space on your plate should be covered with foods that are rich in carbohydrate. Now, high carbohydrate doesn't mean um, unhealthy. It just means high carbohydrate. So that could be bread, rice, corn, um, pasta. It could be fruit, because fruit is a high carbohydrate food. It could also be a, a treat, like um, a dessert, especially this time of year. Another fourth of the space on your plate is best if it's filled with a protein-rich food. And that could be chicken, turkey, veal, tofu, tempeh, cheese, eggs, beef, pork, fish, sard all the varieties of fish, sardines, salmon, and so on. So a fourth of the plate filled with protein. And then a half of your plate filled with any variety of vegetables that you enjoy. <coughs> now, that doesn't mean you have to eat them naked. <coughs> All vegetables are wonderful, but they sometimes need a little help. So a touch of salad dressing, some olive oil, a sprinkle of any herbs and seasonings, whether they are um, very piquant, or savory, whatever makes them welcome to your plate, and of course, welcome to your fork. That's the way to do it. So I have some uh, some more images to share with you. So imagine during that. This is good all year long, but let's think holidays. Breakfast. Where will your? That's when I think a lot of pastries find their way. <coughs> Excuse me. That could be croissant. Um, a bread pudding. I, I welcome anybody to give me their examples of some favorite ready or pastry type foods that they enjoy. And so if you were doing the plate method, here is a section on the plate filled with, I'm going to guess that's couscous, because uh, this is kind of a Mediterranean look. But if that, if, if on a Sunday morning that turns into um, a blueberry muffin, you can rock it. All right, here's something that actually is more similar to what people with a Chinese food heritage might include. <coughs> Pardon me, in which there are dumplings, and so the outer part of the dumpling is where your bread or your pastry type food is, and the filling of the dumpling might be rich in protein. Similarly here, by the way, when I look at this plate, I see a lot of white space. So if you're, if you like a very small morning meal, that's fine. If you like your meals to be, as um, the phrasing used to be, eat like a king in the morning, a prince in the midday, and a pauper in the afternoon. I'm going to say that's very male oriented. So let's say you eat like a queen in the morning, a princess in the midday, and somebody whose resources are a little more limited in the evening, then this could be a modest breakfast or a modest dinner. It's up to you, but these are all fine. As I said, these are body friendly. We have the tomatoes, we have um, a leafy vegetable. This could be cilantro. Uh, this would be a whole wheat, and that is also on the anti-inflammatory list. <coughs> Excuse me. And here, is a, another simple morning meal, cottage cheese, English muffin, and some 
um, cucumbers. Yeah, I stared at him and I said, which one of those? Oh, right, cucumbers, okay. Now let's talk about lunch or dinner. Uh, here is an example of how you would use plate method. One quarter protein, one quarter high carbohydrate, one half veggies. And then where would you put your favorite level? I'm imagining that someone has um, brought to my house some kalaloo that might have a lot of oil in it. Doesn't matter, kalaloo will be welcome to my plate. Someone might have brought or offered me their sweet potato casserole, which if I, you, you know, respect to everybody that does a sweet potato casserole, they always have a lot of, they, a rich amount of butter. <coughs> but it fits on your plate if it's in one quarter of the space. Um, here is another example of where you have three varieties of veggies, some corn, uh, carrots, some broccoli, and some uh, beets. And then you have, oh, that actually could be purple carrot. I'm pretty sure it's beets. If you were being offered from a neighbor or a friend um, a rich food from a holiday uh, buffet, it can always fit if it's a rich carbohydrate, a protein source, or a vegetable source. Um, I have had a few friends make jokes lately about going to Wingstop. Has anyone gone to Wingstop? My first, and may I say only, time going was on Veterans Day, because they do a free meal for veterans. And there we were, asking for our free meal. <clears throat> it was good chicken. <coughs> Okay, we're still saying the plate method is a way to incorporate all of your favorite holiday treats. So now let's figure, maybe you've gone to, you're going to a party and there's munchies at the party or they're going, you have people who are dropping by and you want to serve them during the holidays some snacks. <coughs> so the bottom row are good examples of ways to think of one half of your plate as veggies. One sec. Uh, to think of one quarter of your plate as high, high carbohydrate. So here's someone, this is a real person who I know, and that's her, her thumbnail and her, and her thumb, where she had a half uh, celery, one quarter high protein, of which the protein is the nuts and cheese, and one quarter high carbohydrate, fig bars. She was happy as a, as a clam. Are clams happy? Who's ever interviewed a clam? But either way, they look like they're smiling. And maybe you're at another buffet where you could, um, so this is actually more of a Spanish tortilla, but it could also be something like pizza, where you put the salad on the pizza and you're in business. Maybe you're at a, a party um, where you're given um, servings of sushi rolls or some, um, Asian type items uh, a la carte. Just keep in mind one quarter high carb, one quarter protein, one quarter, one half veggie. Now, next slide. Um, a good basic reminder, uh, especially since we noted that the anti-inflammatory foods that you want to eat all year long is to eat your veggies and fruits. And while there's a campaign that says five a day, the color way, seven or more fruits or vegetables a day is great. The fiber makes you feel full. Um, this is good for, you know, meandering around a party or a, uh, another celebration. Another point that's a good basic reminder for you party animals out there, never go to a party hungry. Maybe I don't want to make a suggest you have a big meal and then when the big meal is over, you go to the party and then they have even more. Um, frankly, for those of us who are beyond age 55, our stomach capacity doesn't really want to eat crazy large volumes anymore. But there is definitely a good idea is to have a little something before you arrive at the celebration. Now, we're still making our holiday foods body friendly. And remember, body friendly means low in saturated fat generally low in total fat, high in fiber, high in colorful fruits and vegetables, which are also good sources of potassium and are also good sources of low sodium. And maybe you are a holiday chef 
who does do the elaborate fancy cooking. So let's start with desserts. Why wait until the end? Okay, so we have wonderful sweets that are available, that are introduced and served and, and um, in the stores or online during holidays. I did not show fruitcake. Right, let's just pretend fruitcake's not there. Um, but there are the stolen, Cristolan, there's the panettone, there's the black Caribbean fruitcake. So my first message is not that these are considered bad foods. They're delicious, they're wonderful, they're, they're seasonal. Put them on your plate in the proportion and the everything can fit. But there are some things that you can do if you are the baker to possibly make them a little lower in calories and a little higher in potassium and higher in fiber. So whatever the ingredients are, try skim milk instead of whole. Um, sometimes the recipe will be pretty ex uh, enjoyable with applesauce in place of oil. Um, you might try a sugar substitute in place of sugar, but that's not gonna be good in baking because sugar provides volume to a product, not just sweetness. This might be better in things that are liquid where the volume of sugar is really not important because it dissolves. It's important, but it isn't critical to texture. And it's possible depending on what you're serving. If a liquid needs to be thickened, rather than add butter, <coughs> excuse me, you can use flour, cornstarch, potato flakes, yogurt. I have even seen people put um, oatmeal in the blender until it comes out like a powder and use that to thicken. So what would we be thickening? Maybe a stew. Maybe a, um, I know that there's a, a, a lot of recipes that allow you to cook something for several hours so that it, it reduces and thickens. But if it's not quite thick enough, you may still want to add something to thicken it. So non-fat evaporated milk, potato flakes, um, oatmeal that's been put in the blender to be very small, flour and cornstarch instead of uh, butter or more oil. Okay, and this information is contributed by a group called the Calorie Council. Calorie Council is also big on artificial sweeteners, which is not a problem for me. I, I look at the big picture. If reducing sugar by using an artificial sweetener doesn't evoke anything adverse in your body, then we're okay with it. All right. So one of those holiday breads is the panettone. And is it possible to have a lower calorie panettone? And I've seen several recipes. I will confess I have not tried one myself. But the recipes say that the traditional one, which is delicious and wonderful and you can find a lot of places, if you cut the butter down from a, four to a, from a half of a cup to a fourth of a cup, you'll cut out calories per serving. You'll cut out saturated fat per serving. If instead of using whole eggs, you try silken tofu or egg whites, and silken tofu will then make it more vegan, and you can definitely cut the sugar in half. Now, each of these changes will make a slight change in the texture of your panettone. But most often, if you have experience making it, you can kind of feel your way through and make little adjustments so that a portion is a little more body friendly. Okay, and I'm sure that Barbara will put this on YouTube and you can see the link where a panettone recipe for reducing calories is available. So let's go on. If you are a baker, and I, I do love to bake, and I hope some of you were um, around the day that we did a spa day where I made cupcakes. They were mini cupcakes, but you could make a large one or you could put it in a, a tube pan of chocolate cake without flour, but using um, black beans that were put in the food process. <coughs> Excuse me. So many recipes call for baker's chocolate. And baker's chocolate is not bad. In fact, one of the body-friendly targets is to reduce your saturated fat. 
chocolate is high in saturated fat, but it is also high in fats that may not be so body, so, so dangerous, they may be okay. But if you wanna cut out the saturated fat, you can replace chocolate with cocoa. And here is the cocoa um, container. I'm going to increase the um, size of the, I'll just move it over here and I can move it back. So what you see at the bottom of the container, and this is in all the supermarkets, the same old cocoa container, that if you want to replace either milk chocolate or <clears throat> um, bittersweet baking chocolate, you can do it with tablespoons of cocoa powder and the addition of oil. It says shortening or oil, but you can use oil because shortening <coughs> is definitely not body friendly. Okay. Um, I'm just going to bring this back to the corner where it was, hold on a second. And if anyone wants to see that label enlarged a bit more, let me know in the chat and I'll do that. I do see one thing in the chat. How can we think it with barley? Absolutely, barley makes stews into great and barley is very rich in soluble fiber. Thank you for that one. Um, thank you, Roberta, okay. <clears throat> so, we can also do whipped toppings. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the content of the slide. Uh, note that less sugar. So often you can reduce sugar without noticing it, not cut it in half, then you will notice it, but you can you know, shave a bit off. Every little bit helps with total calories. Um, you can use less fat by using fat-free sour cream. What about a whipped topping? I do like a piece of pumpkin pie or a piece of sweet potato pie with some little dollop of something on it. And when it's whipped cream, it's like, it's like, uh, you know, extra weight, extra, extra mercy on your, your body. So how about if you put some Greek yogurt <clears throat> on your pie <coughs> or something like Cool Whip Light? I know, I hope I didn't lose respect by saying Cool Whip. Because Cool Whip is like insane chemicals, but it uh, gives you the, the moment of whipped cream without the saturated fat. But I got a new one for you. If you open a can of beans, there's always a little murky, cloudy stuff in the top, right? I'm calling it goop. Well, it turns out that that goop is called aquafaba. An aquafaba, here is a recipe can be mixed with maple syrup or another sweetener and a little bit of vanilla extract. And when you combine the chickpea liquid and you mix it in a bowl on high speed, it turns into a whipped topping. So here's an image of it. Um, there are YouTube videos that will teach you how to do it. So you literally take, I'm gonna scroll to the slide, the previous slide. If you have a 15 and a half ounce can, um, it says no salt added chickpeas. But if you can't find that, of course you can always soak and boil your own chickpeas. And there's that, if, I hope everyone understands what I'm talking about, that sort of murky, odd looking stuff. And whenever you open a recipe for using canned beans, it always says rinse the beans. And I always say, no, don't rinse the beans, save that stuff because that's soluble fiber. It's like miracle stuff that comes out of beans and it's really good. So now you see, you can even turn it into a whipped topping. Anybody here feel adventurous enough to try to do that in the next few days, weeks, months? Yeah. Okay, and um, so that's an option. Uh, the re re recipes. Um, I'm pretty sure, Barbara, if you are going to post the, the, the um, PowerPoint, the link to the recipes is in the PowerPoint. So here um, is the link to where the recipe is there. Or if you simply go to YouTube and say aquafaba, is that a whole new vocabulary word for everybody? <clears throat> You'll get a bunch of different videos showing um, how to do it. But yes, I can share that uh, later on. Okay, excellent. 
So as we leave Aquafaba, who knew, right? Okay, let's move on to the next example of how we are making our holiday foods body friendly. Well, there's a whole bunch of wonderful things that are um, flattened and rolled and covered and, and dipped that I could never imagine not ever eating again. And that these are not necessarily holiday, but they're because they take a lot of effort to prepare. They generally are something done in a traditionally with sort of a division of labor and done during holidays. So you have vodkas, you have pasteles, you have tamales. And do you really take these foods and change the recipe in any way? Well, mainly the ingredients here are pretty standard. So you're looking at fitting them on your plate method rather than changing the ingredient. But when it comes a lot, because you could dip it once again in a low fat sour cream, you could um, fry them in a nonstick pan so that you incorporate less fat. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> And then you can saute in a body friendly fat, which would be one which is rich in what we call monounsaturated. And I don't own an air fryer. Does anyone here own them? And what do you think? I have heard fabulous things like that. Once you get an air fryer, you never go back. But I just don't want one more thing sitting on my counter. I think that's well, most of us are, we're simple girls, yeah but it's a way to keep foods from having a higher calorie content. So next message is, if I'm going to emphasize monounsaturated fat, I wanna talk about what foods are rich in monounsaturated fat and how you know them when you're in the supermarket. And the main ones, monounsaturated fat, so by the way, Life is not complete until you've had to look at a bar graph on a Friday morning, right? Okay. So we're saying the light green represents monounsaturated fat. And for all the fats along the side, the fat of beef, the fat of butter, the fat of cheese, the fat of chicken, of um, a few things that we'll probably never buy, like hemp oil or or we're not using, well, we may use lard. I'm not bashing lard. But you'll see that the light green is in everything. But the ones that are very high in light green are olive oil and canola oil as 71 and 59% respectively. <coughs> <coughs> so if you're going to saute your latkes or, you, or any other plantain or potatoes or any onions, garlic, your usual, your basics, the more monounsaturated fat, the better. And on the flip side, the lower the saturated fat, the better. And that makes it more body friendly. So you can also see that the fat of peanut oil um, is 44% monounsaturated. That's pretty good. Uh, it's sesame oil is 39, but you really don't use a lot of sesame oil when you cook because of the, the flavor is so rich. Um, standard fats in the supermarket that are called vegetable oil are usually soybean oil, which is only 23% mono. I cannot tell you that using soybean oil for your life, is, your entire life, is somehow unhealthy. Uh, similarly, corn oil, <clears throat> which is very low in mono, but high in poly, <coughs> is not necessarily dangerous, but all the research suggests that the monounsaturated fats are more body friendly. So that's the theme of what I want you to take away. And now we're going to talk more about sweets. Okay. So if you're frying donuts, or you're making mince pies, or you're making these um, Greek cookies, uh, melamakaroma, I said that wrong, please forgive me. Once again, the ingredients are fairly standard, and if you um, reduce the fat or reduce the sugar, your texture might be slightly different, but it does afford you a slightly more body-friendly version. 
And then these foods can easily fit on your plate in the high carbohydrates section, as long as half of your plate is veggies and a fourth of your plate is high protein food. I think I've got everybody drooling looking at these. Let me move on. <clears throat> now, holiday beverages are no joke either, because um, I think this is where we probably have more um, sort of misappreciation uh, for caloric density. If you eat a piece of food that's high in calories, you feel it. A high fat food sort of takes longer to empty your stomach. Um, but a liquid pretty much goes through you because of gravity. It's not, it doesn't even stay around long. And there's no way to appreciate the density of the calories per mouthful. So they can be kind of scary. Uh, what are our favorites? Eggnog, hot chocolate, champagne. Well, I, sh I wish I could say champagne. That true to me probably is twice a year thing. Um, I picked cranberry juice, not because orange juice or any of the other fruit juices or fruit, fruit um, cocktails are not good, but I'm going to come back to it. <coughs> so if we wanted to try to hack, <coughs> if we want to try to hack any of these holiday favorites by making them lower in calories, here's some ideas. Now, eggnog is something that I don't even look for in the store until late November, early December. Um, but here, if you go online, is what is called an easy eggnog recipe. And I haven't um, hesitated to put three unhappy faces to say, oh, let's look at these ingredients. A cup of sugar, two cups of carnation evaporated milk, a cup of heavy cream, six eggs. Okay, my heart is beating faster and my arteries are narrowing talking about it. And then, of course, the bourbon rum, the cognac, that's pretty optional, but most of the time it's part of it. So this is going to be a very rich, and I'd say unnecessarily rich food. So can we hack our own? Well, there was an old hack that my mom and I used to do where we would take carnation instant breakfast, eggnog flavor, and mix it with milk, and that would be our eggnog that we would share. Way cheaper. And um, if you were going to put a little dash to rock or something. And I did say a little dash. But that's not in the store anymore. They, there's a joke about these were the foods of the 70s. Now if you were looking for something like that, Carnation no longer calls them instant breakfast. But they're called breakfast essentials. Yeah, right. That's called marketing. And the flavors here say milk chocolate, French vanilla, and strawberry sensation, whatever. Um, these are still probably a little more um, fancy and will tickle your tongue in place of an eggnog. But another thing that you could do with eggnog is replace some of the ingredients. So here is the Joy Bauer low calorie eggnog. And Joy Bauer. Most of you might recognize her as the dietitian who's on the Today Show. And I know she's, um, she's there several times a month. She's published lots of books. She's a registered dietitian like me. And uh, I think she's got comes up with some good ideas. Uh, so here's what her recommendation is. So you get a three quarter ounce package of instant vanilla pudding. And I have at the bottom here, and I should probably make my slide a bit smaller, that there are also no sugar added vanilla puddings that might also be lower in calories. They're gonna have a slightly different um, texture as well because they will have uh, thickeners in them. Okay, then five cups of low fat milk, and then a little rum extract instead of the rum, and of course, fresh nutmeg. Now, there is a set of instructions on the website where this is um, published that gives you a sense of, you know, you're going to do this with a, a whisk or an electric beater and when to say it's okay, now the time is an all right to um, stop beating. But in general, that's a much lower eggnog and lower alcohol approach. It's got good sources of calcium because it's a good source of, um, of milk. All right, <clears throat> another eggnog hack or another ca uh, 
um, <clears throat> beverage pack for the holidays, um, you could take your eggnog from the store and dilute it with fat-free milk or fat-free treat cream. Huh? How many of us have, in, have all, at some point in life said, oh, there's not enough for everybody here. I have to stretch it. Whatever you were doing, we stretched it. Well, here's a way to stretch some of the eggnog, but now you're making it more body friendly. We can also think about um, the hot chocolate instead of the a rich chocolate made with cream and milk chocolate, trying one of the no sugar added. And I have a, a row of asterisks here because I'm going to mention more about that in a moment. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, if you like champagne, it's not something that you're going to drink a large volume of because it's A, expensive, and B, yeah, who wants a large volume? But you can lighten it up with something like cranberry juice, and you can use a light cranberry juice. That's often something that you can find in the supermarket. By the way, when you buy cranberry juice, it's really called cranberry juice cocktail because it's made with cranberry juice plus sweeteners. If you've ever had 100% cranberry juice, it is so insanely tart that you pucker. It's like drinking lemon juice, and you're probably going to say, okay, somebody bring me some kind of sweetener, quick. Um, so let's talk about the no sugar added hot chocolate. So there's a few varieties that are out there. Somebody might remember Swiss Miss, um, and what the caution was when you read the label because it was sweetened with the sweetener that is the same as equal it was sweetened with aspartame and aspartame as a artificial sweetener will begin to fall apart when it's hot in the in the presence of heat so if you bought sugar no sugar added hot chocolate that was sweetened with aspartame and you pour boiling water on it, I can guarantee you by the time you took your first sip where you wouldn't scald your tongue, the sweetness had already cut in half. Of course, you could add another envelope or two of aspartame to it. That wouldn't have been a big deal. Um, but the idea is that the actual molecule that functions as a sweetening agent stimulates the sweet receptors in your mouth. But when aspartame is heated, and especially if you pour boiling water on it, the molecule breaks apart and it can no longer stimulate sweet receptors. But look here, these are two brands. Um, well, that's it. This is obviously Nestle and, oh, they, they're both Nestle. I'm sorry, I thought I had two different brands, but okay. What you'll see in the ingredients is that they are sweetened with um, sucralose, and sucralose is the one that we know to be Splenda and something called asulfane potassium. And these two do not break down in the presence of heat. So if you put, put boiling water on here, you don't have to worry that in five minutes your hot chocolate is gonna taste strangely bitter. Um, it's true also, uh, I could enlarge this if it would be useful. But it similarly gives you the ingredients, and the sweetener is sucralose, which is Splenda, and something called asulfane potassium, which is not by brand name because it's not something that you and I could buy over the counter, but it's used in the food industry also as a sweetening agent without calories. So it isn't a sugar free food. You know why? Because it is made from milk, and milk has lactose. So the five grams of carbohydrate on both products doesn't represent added sugar. And it does say down here, total sugar is four. It means that it's literally the lactose that's naturally found in chocolate. So my takeaway here is no sugar added chocolate would be a reasonably good way to make hot chocolate a bit more body friendly during the holidays, if you're going to treat yourself to some extra, um, I mean, I don't who know who here is gonna go ice skating at Rockefeller Center. You won't find me there. Um, I'll bike past it, but I'm not getting on ice. 
Okay, what else is new down here? So we can say there's other treats that we can enjoy during our holidays that are fun finger foods that are not very um, time consuming or the ingredients are not rare and hard to find. So you can melt cocoa and um, the oil we mentioned before and dip bananas in there, put those rascals on the refrigerator and that looks like fun. Um, when I was a kid, we used to call these ants on a log, but it's not just kid food, it's fun food. So remember, body friendly means high in fiber. You can't get much higher in fiber than celery and dried fruit. Uh, body friendly means high in potassium. Bananas are a wonderful source of potassium, as are raisins. You also know that these are essentially fat free, so they're low in saturated fat, low in total fat. They meet all the guidelines of the Mediterranean, the dietary approaches to stop hypertension, the therapeutic lifestyle change, and they're anti-inflammatory because they're fruits and vegetables. Um, another fave for me is popcorn. Oh, we have a quick question here. Sure. Um, Should I take a asking, peek? Don't sugar substitutes cause cancer? Because that's been oh. concern. Okay. And then there's one. Are we better off not to consume chemical sweeteners at all? I agree with you. Um, I think the research, well, okay, total disclosure, they don't cause cancer. Um, in the early 90s, I was paid as a consultant to the company that was making Splenda. And in our training, and it was a group of dietitians, we were given the, the whole A to Z about the whole artificial sweetener world. First of all, they want you to call them sugar substitutes but we like to call them artificial sweeteners because that's kind of what they really are. And what the research has been and who conducted the research and who evaluated the research and where the approval process was. So that's to say that it's very political. Um, the science is not um, shaky at all, is that they don't cause cancer. But I would never tell anybody, you need to start s switching over to equal or Splenda or sweet and low, or any of those others. They're not going to really do a huge thing to you. There's no, there's no proof that eating those helps you lose weight. But we're just saying, and my message now, for the concentration of calories that holiday foods brings, if you can bring it down a bit and still enjoy it for you know short term. Now, I'm gonna go back to the cancer comment because I think cancer question, that's really important. <clears throat> the um, the main cancer association was with saccharin. <coughs> so the person who asked the question about cancer, I want to just be sure, I want to know actually, are you um, referring to saccharin? I'm just going to take a quick look. Cancer substance cause cancer. So Cynthia, are you referring to saccharin or all of them? All of them. Okay. Um, if I may then just talk about saccharin for a second. Saccharin is sweet and low. So sweet and low, first of all, has been in the food supply for almost 125 years. And there's no cancer associated with it for every effort to compare, to look at dietary patterns and um, development of cancer. Uh, so that's one thing that I can say. I don't own stock in Sweet and Low. God knows. It's not on patent, so it's probably a very low profit margin. Um, number two, Sweet and Low is a water-soluble chemical. So that means that it travels throughout the body in the water. It doesn't deposit it in fat tissue. It doesn't linger in muscle tissue. It basically goes through you, and then when your, your kidneys filter it, it goes into the um, bladder and it gets excreted. So the early research on sweet and low used rats. Uh, I think I don't know if it's ever been tested on humans, truthfully, because that's a that's a tough um, informed consent letter to write. But either way, it was done on rats, and they were given a high concentration of sweet and low or saccharin, 
from birth. And high concentration meaning, and if I don't remember the exact amount, I will just wing it and say something like 50 times what a human would eat in a given day, and it was from birth. So it was an unre unrealistic amount. Okay, across the lifespan, this water-soluble chemical would concentrate in the bladder, because as I said, it goes through the water, gets filtered by the kidney, it's in the bladder, and it created crystals in the bladder because it was so concentrated, and the crystals caused um, irritation of the lining of the bladder, which led to um, sort of an abscess that was interpreted as a tumor. So it was really the concentration of the crystals that irritated the bladder lining that appeared to be a tumor. It did not affect um, breast, did not affect prostate, did not affect brain. It was not a bloodborne cancer like a leukemia. It was not a cancer of any other part of the body except the bladder that had been smacked around for the whole lifespan of this poor rat by being fed this high concentration of sweet of saccharin that crystallized and caused these um, these tumors or um, not quite blister, but you know what I'm trying to say. <coughs> <clears throat> the other research on equal and aspartame, aspartame is equal, and Splenda have not had as much of a cancer connection as whether or not it changes the risk of getting headaches or any other kind of neurological sense of, I'm sleepy, I think I need to relax, or did it really take care of a sweet craving? I hope I'm not running too far into the, the science of it, but cancer, no. And that mostly it has to do, it's curious, one of the things that we were also taught is that any of those new food ingredients have to be um, approved for an environmental impact. So in other words, when we eat Sweet and Low or when we eat Splenda, Obviously, we excrete it. It goes into the sewer system. The sewer system dumps somewhere, and eventually, particles of that wind up in the water table, in the lakes, and the rivers. And that had the environmental impact of the artificial sweetener had to be documented, and it was a part of the approval. And it was approved in Europe and Australia before it was approved in the United States. And they have my opinion is that they have a more rigorous approval process. So why did the United States take longer? And it was also politics. The, this this uh, equal company knew that Splenda was going to knock them out of the water, kind of just blow them out of the water because it was a better sugar. And they therefore raised many more legal questions about it, which delayed the approval. Now, if I go into... McDonald's or what's the other one? Uh, Starbucks. That's kind of funny, right? I couldn't think of the word Starbucks. And I order tea or coffee. I probably will get, I don't want to get the syrup that is so sugar rich. I probably will put Splenda in it for those occasional cups and not really think I'm hurting myself because I don't, I don't want it to be quite killer sweet. You could do a half and half, um, but I'm glad you asked the question, and I hope my answer, although long, was understandable and, and reasonable. Um, and the other thing is, you, their life, if you never <clears throat> put an artificial sweetener in your mouth, life goes on just fine. Okay, I see Barbara says, if you're going to use one, which artificial sweetener would you pick? Ah. Well, that's a good question too. And you, you know, I don't go with a simple answer most of the time. So some things work well in a fruit setting. Some things work well in a, uh, like um, something that has vanilla versus cinnamon versus mint versus um, nutmeg. And so even when those sweeteners are developed and used in the food supply, there's a lot of research to say if we add 
um, Splenda to a soda, is it, is it going to mix with cola very well, or will it mix better with cola as in doesn't matter Pepsi or Coke, or will it do better in ginger ale? So those whole flavor research um, process is, is pretty interesting. I think I would go along with Splenda. And I, I, would, uh, I would admit, maybe because I learned the most about it in comparison to the others. But in my general personal sense, I'll drink whichever one is handy and, and not really have any worries. I, I think they're body friendly and they give you options. Would I give them to a woman who's pregnant? Would I give them to little kids? I have to think about that some more because I would hesitate. Although the research has been done on what crosses the placenta and whether or not it affects um, growth and development, and it's all come out okay. Um, so when I do advocacy for the American Diabetes Association, similarly, there's a question about people who are very conscientiously keeping their blood sugar in a very specific range. These are good options to allow for you know, enjoying um, sweet and, and sort of, uh, you know, naughty things without uh, the consequence of chasing the blood sugar up and down again. So those answers are qualified, but sincere. I think Barbara disappeared. Did I talk her to death? Oh, there she is. No, no, I'm still here. So, um, but we are getting close to 12. So why don't you go ahead yeah. and we'll save any other questions to the end. Okay, I think I have two more slides. Um, so yeah, this is my wrap. All food, oh, this is the, just the last two over here, popcorn. And if you ever have dates and you fill them with some sort of a cream cheese, a light cream cheese or a peanut butter, you have all the right anti-inflammatory, low saturated fat, high monounsaturated fat, high fiber, low sodium food right in front of you. Okay. <clears throat> Remember all foods fit, uh, keep that proportion in mind. And the last slide is happy everything. Happy Kwanzaa, Merry Christmas as of Monday. Happy Hanukkah in general to all of you. Have wonderful holidays. Barbara, how, much, how would you like me to go? Or do you need the, the Zoom link for a one o'clock, a 12 o'clock um, presentation? I'm looking at the rest of the question. Maybe you should use smaller size plates. Excellent idea. Roberta? <coughs> and plate method says, if you eat plate method and you get, you're still hungry, refill the plate in the same proportion. Okay, and I think the only other comment somebody had made, I think was simply about the, the air fryers earlier, that the most reviews say the air fryer breaks down or has problems after approximately a year, but I have <laughs> heard everybody who uses one yeah. Like I said, won't go back. Yeah. Okay, I got a breakdown. Maybe I'll borrow one and see. Any <laughs> any other questions, Barbara, or should we should we call it? Uh, we have two new messages. I like to Barbara says I like to use 30 calorie almond milk with one square of dark chocolate to make a hot chocolate and avoid artificial sweeteners. That sounds delicious. Uh, Barbara, that's excellent advice. Everybody should save that one. Now, I have my, my, my cronies who argue that almond milk is very environmentally unfriendly because it takes so many gallons of water for the almond orchards to create one almond and then almond milk. And then oat milk is better. Is it how many, Cynthia? Nine gallons of water for how many almonds? For one almond? Okay, yes. Yeah, so it's a, it's a mean ratio for an earth where water, you know, good water, um, you know, water is, is one of those fascinating studies too, as to where communities have been, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, you know, water is stolen from them to feed other communities and quality of water is not there. So I can't blame almonds for that, but it, at least we can say that oat milk uses far less Yeah, food justice and water are, are all together, part of the same story. 
How are we doing, Barbara? I think we're doing great. Um, unless I see any other questions, I think.